So, we're here in Madison, Tennessee, in the home of the late, great Hank Snow. And uh, we're with another fellow that, boy, he made some good music over the years, Mr. Glenn Douglas Tubb. Say hello to the folks. Howdy, folks. There you go. So, uh, why don't we just start with how you came to Nashville and when? Woo! 1947. In a school bus with all the seats, not all the seats, most of the seats yanked out of it and a little bit of furniture and a little bit of this and that and my family, my mama, my daddy, my grandmother, my two sisters and four brothers. Now why did you pack up and come to Nashville? Well, I can't go into all the details, but my father had got out of the Navy and uh, uh, Uncle Ernest was having a few problems uh, collecting his money from his uh, personal appearances. And, uh, of course, we're talking about the great Ernest Tony. Uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, so he wanted Dad to come and be his road manager and uh, take care of all that stuff and whip up on them guys if they had to be whipped up on, you know, to get the money out of them and all that. And uh, so it was 1947 before they had a few days off where they could come to Texas and uh, get our family and move it up here. I mean, he was. He was a working man. Well, he worked over 300 days a year right up to the end, you know. And he was working about 365 back then. So anyway, we got to, we got up here in uh, 19, June of 19, 1947. Yeah. A long time ago. Things are a little different then. had one big job ahead of us shortly after we got here. Uncle Ernest had uh, opened a record shop on Commerce Street downtown. And uh, he decided it was not the location he thought it was when he moved in there. And he had already started the Midnight Jamboree there on Saturday nights, and, uh, and that was a real hassle, uh, trying to get uh, the band set up and uh, the guests that would come in, because there wasn't hardly room to turn around in that place. It was such a small shop. Explain for a moment about the, the Midnight Jamboree. Midnight Jamboree is a radio program. It's the uh, second oldest uh, radio show in the world. Uh, Grand Ole Opry is the only one that's been on the air longer. And Uncle Larry started it so that the young musicians and singers coming up would have a place to come and sing and be heard, not just by the people, but by record executives. And, uh, so that was, that was the key to the whole thing, and he thought it was absolutely necessary to provide that, and uh, it's still going on today. But me and my brothers, we got the job of moving that record shop from uh, Commerce Street down to Broadway. They didn't, have a, didn't Hank have a, a western shop? Hank Williams had a, a Western clothing store just on the other side of the alley. Uh, the Ernest Tubb record shop was on one side of the alley, and Hank Audrey's Western shop was on the other side. And back then, uh, everything was 78s. 45s hadn't even come out yet. Big old records like that, and some of them about that thick. That, you know, you look at them wrong, and they're gonna crack on you. Well, 
we got to move all of those from Commerce to Broadway on the back of an old state body truck. And the springs are about like that, you know. You hit any kind of a hole and you got a problem. But we got it down. We moved that whole record shop in one night. They opened for business the next morning. He was a great man, uh, great stylist. Uh, you know, he always said he wasn't a singer, and he credited his success because he was not a great singer. He said anybody can put a nickel in the jukebox and play one of my records and sing along with me, and said they all sound better than I do. <laughs> so it made him look good to the girlfriends, you know. Uh, he was a he was a good man. He, uh, helped an awful lot of people in the music business and out. Uh, they had to start screening his mail at the record shop uh, because if Ernest got it, the total strangers would write him and ask him for $100 or $500 for this or that. Well, it didn't make any difference. He felt sorry for everybody and he'd just send the money to them. So. They said, we got to put a stop to this, so they started screening his mail and they wouldn't let him have anything unless it was some, you know, something very important. But he, uh, he did a lot of stuff like that, and you know, he's helped a lot of people in the music business. He helped a lot of them get into the music business. Oh, and uh, quite a few. Larry, the well, that fellow right there, uh, Hank Snow, one, was sitting in his home. Uh, he told everybody. Uh, he never, never backed away from it. He told everybody right up to the end that Ernest Stubb is the reason he was here. And he owed it all to him. But there were so many others. Tell me about a few of the people that you saw come through Nashville and make it. And, and, and of course, you, you became friends with a lot of these folks. How about Hank Williams? <laughs> Talk a little bit about uh, Hank. Hank was, a, Hank was fantastic. Of course, he was my hero and most everybody else's. And how old were you when you met Hank for the first time? Uh, 16. First time I met him. And, uh, and, uh, he died in, uh, New Year's Day of 53, and we were working Austin at the time, and after he died, we went back and played a while longer at the club down there and finished out some school. And, but Hank was, uh, he was just fantastic. Uh, he was, you know, he's only 29 when he died, but there was something about him that uh, made him Seemed like he was a hundred years old, you know. With the, he had this wisdom about him out there. You know, not every wise person in the world would get drunk and uh, make all the mistakes he made. But all in all, uh, you can't uh, you can't deny the uh, genius that he had for putting words together. And uh, I got to try out a few songs on him that night in Austin before he died. And uh, uh, Justin sang him a song. Our songs were very forgettable. And uh, he sang us a couple of mediocre things called Your Cheating Heart and Kalaja. It was his record that was coming out, you know, and it made me feel about like this. And that's the first time you got to hear this song? Yeah, he, he hadn't come out yet. And he told Justin, he said, uh, hope your daddy will forgive me. He said, I stole one of his lines. And he said, what line did you steal? He said, you walk the floor the way I do, you're cheating hard. We'll tell my thought is just a shell and my head.